We're a cynical lot in this city, but in the last moments of the Millennium Fireworks on New Year's Eve 1999, the word eternity wrote itself in blazing letters across the Harbour Bridge, which you'll probably remember. And we Sydney-siders were almost unanimous in applauding the effect. It's, it is perfect. And some of you might remember Arthur Stace, the eternity man. I know my mother remembers his graffiti. It was, of course, that, that eternity written in fire across the Harbour Bridge, um, which you also see in Martin Sharp's art, with the eternity written across the page, uh, about across the um, canvas, was inspired by Arthur Stace's footpath graffiti. Arthur Stace was illiterate, the son of a janitor, and had an evangelical conversion in 1930. Afterward, he found himself able to chalk this one word on the streets in perfect copper plate, with the long curling tail on the end of the Y forming like a miracle beneath his hand. The next morning, Sydney Siders would experience the eerie thrill of coming across his warnings of hellfire and damnation, committed to the pavements in the pre-dawn hours. But why would showy Sydney, Sin City, Emerald City, gee, I hate those two names, but why would showy Sydney take this strange midnight prophet, Arthur Stace, to its heart? Why does he remain one of our favourite eccentrics? Perhaps it's because no matter what you believe in, you can't escape the eternal in this city. Eternity. It's written in our sandstone, our harbour tides, our southerlies, our suburb's remnant bush. We're closer to nature here than almost any other city. And so we're also closer to the big questions of the beautiful and ugly, life and death, creation and destruction. Not that this is a gloomy city, look outside, quite the reverse. But perhaps we party harder, love our real estate more, spend those extra few minutes in the sun, because the abyss is just that little bit closer here than elsewhere. We enjoy our city because it's not quite tame. We pay its moodiness. We savour its briny air and anticipate its storms. It's a complex, humid cocktail, Sydney, which is why I wouldn't live anywhere else. Let's start with our sandstone. Plenty of it here down in the highway cutting. Plenty of it here on the facade of the gallery. Our sandstone was once an ancient riverbed. Its ripples all point south in the direction of its flow towards the sea, according to author Tim Flannery. And it's now a huge water filter. Even the biggest rains are quickly absorbed into the porous rock to drip for weeks from the cliff faces and walls around the harbour. One of my earliest memories, if not a sign of eternity, then surely at least of human impermanence, is of the slimy extrusions, perhaps recalling old seeps and creeks, running down from the narrow stairs from Dawes Point to the rocks. In fact, our whole city is built on vanished bush creeks, which still flood the foundations of houses in wet weather, as Sydney siders living in their old beds know too well. For example, Boundary Street in Paddington, that's an old riverbed. In fact, if you want to see where the damp, damp is going to find you when you're buying property in Sydney, it's a good idea to look at the postal map as the divisions between the postcodes are often tracing the paths of old watercourses, all those vanished ghostly streams and creeks. Of these thousands of ghost waterways, our most famous is the Tank Stream. Rising to the west from the swamp where Hyde Park now sits, then jinking north to the quay, this was the colony's first water source. Soon polluted, then reinforced with stone, and built under the city's office blocks. Now if you um, go down into um, Martin Place, you'll see small, little, small illuminated markers that actually trace part of the tank stream's journey. From the, it used to, the, the full journey is from, the Senate, uh, is from, from Hyde Park, but it trace, if the, the, the journey from the cenotaph in Martin Place um, is traced with these little illuminated markers into the foyer of Angel Place's concert hall. Um, though in Sydney's typical cycle of rotten renewal, the last time I looked, the lights no longer functioned um, on any of those little markers, except, I think, for the one um, just inside the concert hall, which is actually quite hard to find. But the tank stream itself isn't quiet at all. 
buildings in its path, including the old GPO, or General Post Office, still depend on pumping, pumping systems in their basements to, to, to control the tank stream beneath them. Apparently, um, Abby's old tank stream bookstore, used to the basement used to regularly flood. And the bottom of the AMP building, down by the quay, also requires pumping to, um, to deal with the remnants of the tank stream. Nor, it seems, do we really want to see this waterway conquered. I've um, entered the lottery this year. I'm yet to, I'm yet to get on. Um, I wish, I, I wish I, my number would come up. Um, but such is the, this waterway's hold on Sydney's imagination that applicants apply by lottery to, for the Historic Houses Trust's unad, unad, usually unadvertised twice yearly tours um, to go through the tank stream. And still, this willful stream sometimes prevails. So tours are called off after rain because of gases as well as because of, um, because of the chance of, of, obviously, of drowning and flooding. Then in terms of Sydney's wildness, there's our actual wildlife. Bogong moths arrive clumsily on hot spring winds to cluster in whatever seems cool and cave-like in our buildings. At dusk, flying foxes rise in their thousands from the botanic gardens, just here, to home on the ripe tree beacons, as poet Les Murray wrote, in one of his poems, in our gardens. I always think they look like dense clouds of ash from a bushfire, all sort of rising up at the same time, which again is a slightly infernal sort of image. There are even in the most densely populated inner city suburbs, possums, brush and ringtail, magpies and carawans, of course. Lots of magpies in the cross, particularly in the nicely um, uh, paved areas where they seem to have an advantage over other birds. Rainbow lorikeets and displaced Centralian sacred ibis, which of course have become a bit of a pest here. And what for me are the city's totem animals, our joyful cockatoos. With rusty calls, they hang upside down from television aerials, from the peak of the W Hotel down here in Woolloomooloo, dip across our busiest roads, or nest on the sand sandstone architraves of old buildings, including, I've seen some nesting just across the way in the um, architraves of the State Library across the park. It's hard not to see a larrikin vitality in the way they keep their feathers a pristine, almost luminescent white. Not to mention the boiling life in our harbour and along the coast, especially at this late summer, early autumn time of year, when the water's at its warmest. Schools of prawns, sharp-nosed garfish, jellyfish, seahorses and sharks. When the near monsoonal rains come in January, when bushfires ring the city, when the big southerlies crash through after a heat wave to whip the rigging of yachts against their masts until the harbour sounds like a mad frenzy of bell ringers. There's a sense that this place, remembering its previous incarnation as bush, itches to shrug off our glass towers and Mac mansions. But again, so far as I'm concerned, this is no bad thing. Certainly we fume in traffic jams or stare glumly from the windows of stop trains when it rains and complain that Sydney is broken. But there are as many of us who secretly admire the city's feral will and something darker, more mysterious beneath it. Just ask our writers and artists. The most famous poem about our city, and one incidentally that continues to pop top polls as the nation's favourite, is Kenneth Sless's 1946 Five Bells, an ode to the haunted beauty of our harbour. Looking out at the water from Elizabeth Bay, the poet remembers his friend Joe Lynch, a young newspaper artist who fell from the Manly Ferry on the way to a party on the North Shore, his pockets full of beer bottles, and disappeared. His body was never found. Slessa, in Five Bells, imagines that Joe has long since become a kind of sea thing, an angry presence beneath the water, raging at the world of life above. And as he watches, the harbour seems to keep transforming itself into something outside time. Night and water pour to one rip of darkness, he writes while the Southern Cross is suspended in the water and the harbour floats in air. Joe, meanwhile, seems to have lived his whole life again in the five bells ringing out from a warship in the harbour. Eternity. Actually, Joe was also the model for his brother Guy Lynch's sculpture, Satyr, three years before his death. You might have noticed it down by the Opera House gate in the Botanic Gardens. The Greek demigod leans back on, its pl on his plinth thighs matted and obscenely huge, the left barely able to cross over the right, and hugs one knee with veiny arms. When it was first unveiled here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, critics described the sculpture as both a masterpiece and a pagan work. 
The satyr's face is Joe's, a sardonic barfly's face, eyes half closed, as if wondering whether to recall a story or start a fight. So even this pagan god basking in the sunlight is marked by Sydney's shadows. After Joe d drowned, Guy Lynch went to pieces. He moved to London for a decade and spent his last years on a poultry farm in the city's west here, where he died in 1967. And 10 years later, his wife had the bronze cast made of the original here and placed in the gardens, where it's now a symbol of Sy Sydney's commingling of sex and death, and perhaps even of damnation. The sense of eternity is there too in Brett Whiteley's harbourscapes, which for all their life seem almost to warp beneath the sun's force, to tremble under the weight of azure, urging to return to some more ancient pre-human time. Or read Ruth Park's children's novel, Playing Beatty Bow, in which a tiny lane in the rocks hides a wormhole in time that drops straight through to the colonial past. Without doubt, something about this place nurtures visionaries and eccentrics. One of Sydney's strangest chroniclers and one of my favorite characters in my book was the Reverend Frank Cash, rector of Christ Church, North Sydney. In 1930, seems like that was a particular era for, for visionaries, Cash published his book, Parables of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, a celebration of this mighty, and to his mind, mightily inspired miracle of engineering. His descriptions of its sculpt sculpture, structure, pardon me, are so hallucinatory, he often writes in poetic lines, not even in paragraphs. But Cash found himself even more drawn to photographing the demolition of houses and shops in North Sydney to make way for its great North Stanchion. And so he earned himself the nickname Mascot Padre because as soon as he received a call from one of the workmen that a building was about to come down, he'd raced to the work site with his camera to record it. In this book, we see dozens of pictures of buildings in the very moment of turning to dust before his eyes, before his lens, as if Sydney's already in the grip of Stace's forewarned apocalypse, though to my knowledge, the two men never met. Still, it makes a certain sense that such overwhelming physical beauty might turn our thoughts to paying the piper for our extraordinary luck, or even stir up visions of destruction. Sometimes I wonder if I was oversensitized to the city's wild pitch between glory and ruin by my late 60s and 70s childhood. An only child, I grew up in Raff, then Raffish McMahon's Point, and often traveled over the bridge with my parents, who worked from home but kept an office in the city. At this time, Sydney was caught in a strange limbo between its past Art Deco glories and destruction. A shortage of office space, meaning many of its buildings, were slated for development and had been left to decay. The Queen Victoria building, destined then to become a car park, was a hulk. Derelict Anthony Horden's department store was like a desiccated wedding cake, filling a whole South City block, although to my mind it did have the advantage of having a roller skating rink in its basement, which I longed to go to and was never taken to. Darling Harbour was a muddy tangle of old goods lines below the Piermont Power Station with its four chimneys. I was keenly aware from my parents' conversation of the city's lost arcades, the Parisian grandeur of the Royal, Rose Street with its ballet shops and cafes. Some still clung on, but with an odd connection in my childhood mind to the darkness of the tank stream, like the curved Angel Arcade, which is now the Sydney Concert Hall, which I've already mentioned. Here a man with a long white beard stood behind the counter of the tiny cave-like opal shop, which like something from a fairy tale contained a lucky dip for children. Choose the wrong parcel or take the wrong turn and you might end up in some strange underworld or at least the tank stream. I still have this feeling sometimes about my city that it inhabits more than one time at once. Certainly when I'm walking back into town from Hickson Road at night, and stop under the bridge at Dawes Point to listen to the tide lapping at the old water stairs, I can just for a moment banish the new city and fiery Luna Park opposite from my mind. I imagine First Fleet Lieutenant William Dawes in his observatory on the hill above, working with the Eora to record the few words that remain to us now of their language. Dawes made friends with the, with the teenage girl Petra Garang and her friends. Surely a kind soul. His notebooks lay lost in a London library until 1972. And they record a tantalizing glimpse of language. Dawes learned the words meaning snot and hiccough and the point of the spear, practical words. But he also learned more intimate constructions which are recorded in his notebooks, such as to warm one's hand by the fire and then to squeeze gently the fingers of another person. We shall sleep separate, to extinguish a candle, What's the story behind the other snatches of lost moments in the phrases, 
My friend, he sings about you. My friend, let us two go and bathe. Take hold of my hand and help me up. Perhaps if Dawes had stayed longer and the stories had also been preserved, my mind would not be thrown so far back into the distant past, which sometimes seems easier to connect with than this lost colonial moment. That's the thing, all Sydney's citification can feel temporary, ad hoc, because I think there was such a disconnect between it and the Indigenous culture at the moment of, its, of settlement. At odd moments, I find myself feeling as if thousands of years could disappear to transport me back to primeval forest, even those at that big ancient river that was once here. When I see the city's feral banana trees, for example, answering some primal, primal call to rampant growth in, in tiny East Sydney backyards or even on rooftops, or when I smell the harbour at low tide, always the strongest reminder of my childhood, with its funky umami of iodine and rotting kelp. But of course the city of my childhood would renew itself again and return from gloom to boom. I still remember the wonder of watching the sales of the Opera House rise from our apartment at Mans Point. And even now I never tire of the sheen that plays off their ingenious mix of shell and white tile, mirroring the harbour gleam below. Not so long ago, I was excited to see a fairy penguin paddling by the pontoon at the bridge's eastern edge, actually quite near, um, quite near uh, the, uh, Guy Lynch's satire, a beneficiary of the city's now clean harbour. I'm not alone. I think we're passionate admirers and observers of our city, never sick of its beauties, old and new. I but I like to imagine it's that little frisson of rot, that funky hint of the feral that makes us so attentive. Because, because with Sydney's unpredictable moods, we never quite know what we'll get. Just the other day, um, a friend was in a, Sydney, it was in a restaurant in Neutral Bay when she felt something brush her ankle. Was someone playing footsies? Was it the cuff of her friend's trousers? She looked down and saw something moving. Bush rat, she called out. I love the fact that she had the presence of mind to say bush rat, not just rat, anyway. Bush rat, she called out. She looked down and saw... Uh, she, actually, it turned out to be a tiny and terrified pygmy possum. The restaurant was briefly closed while it was caught and it was taken outside and put in a tree. For me, that's a, that's a Sydney evening, a night out. And of course, Slessor, the poet of five bells, would celebrate King's Cross as the heart of Sydney's combination of the rough and the beautiful, the lovely and the feral. In poems like his collection, Backless Betty from Bondi, in which he celebrates dark chokers lanes and good time girls waking up with headaches illustrated with pictures of unattainable flappers by Virgil Riley, the dwarf artist. Now, Virgil Riley, I think, deserves a, deserves a novel. And in his poem, um, William Street, the red globe of light, the liquor green, the pulsing arrows and the running fire, spilt on the stones, go deeper than a stream. You find this ugly, I find it lovely. Or in his marvellous journalistic writing about King's Cross and Elizabeth Bay. In my favourite story from Slessor's journalism, he records that he looked out from his apartment in Billiard Avenue, still there, Elizabeth Bay, over the harbour, to see that someone in the apartment below was throwing dinner plates out of the window and taking pot shots at them with a rifle in the moonlight. It's hard to think of another city that breeds such enthusiastic internal tourists. It's we locals who book the bridge climb months in advance for anniversaries and birthdays, who hire seaplanes and water taxis for weddings. It's we locals as much as tourists who pack the gallery and the Manly Ferry and the city's vertiginous high-rise bars. Just observe the hundreds of Sydney siders, many of them new arrivals from around the world, drawn to the quay on weekends to admire the view, or the wanderers in the botanic gardens and sun seekers in Hyde Park. Yes, we love to look at ourselves, to compete for the best view, and of course to show off. But is this the shallowness that outsiders accuse us of? I prefer to think it comes with a healthy dose of wonder even of awe. On a beautiful day like today, when the sun lays an almost misty haze on the water and the air is glassy, Sydney can be almost too lovely to believe in. Perhaps it's why we have such a soft spot for its midnight people, its mad prophets like Stace, who if nothing else affirm this feeling, which can touch us at any moment, I believe. In the 60s, workers restoring the GPO clock dismantled and placed in secure storage during the Second World War unpacked its bell, and there inside it, written in faint chalk, was the last message from Stace, eternity. Thank you. <laughs>